All right. Howdy ho, folks. Thought I was going to be late. I had an update for Zoom and didn't know. And damn updates. All right. Just need a quick second here to get my agenda printed out, and then we'll get rocking and rolling. Why do I have two screens? I have two screens. All righty. Hopefully everybody's doing good on this beautiful day. How are we doing, staff? Are you guys ready to rock and roll? Everything's looking good on this end. All right. Well, let's call to order this May 17th, 2022 Missoula Consolidated Planning Board meeting. Uh, Heather, can we do roll call, please? Yes, Josh Schrader. Here. Josh is here. Ellie Costello. Here. Ellie is here. Toon Palm. Here. Toon is here. Dave Loomis. Here. Dave is here. Micah Sewell. Here. Micah is here. Shane Morrissey. Here. Shane is here. Sean McCoy. Here. Sean is here. Sierra Farmer. Sierra is absent. She had indicated she couldn't make the meeting today. Dory Galels. Here. Dory is here. And Rick Hall. Here. Rick is here. Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Outstanding, thank you, Heather. And let's move on to approval of the minutes from the April 19th, 2022 meeting. Ideally, everybody got um, time to look that over. And uh, we'll just do an up and down vote or if somebody has um, some corrections, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'll make a motion, that's appropriate. Yes, please do. Uh, I move that we approve the minutes from the April 19th meeting. I'll second. Go ahead, Dory. <clears throat> Seconded by Dory. Josh, you're in a different place. All right. Um, let's see. Let's go ahead and do that up and down vote. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Hearing no nays, the motion carries unanimously. And the next line item on our agenda is public comment on um, anything that's not on the agenda tonight. Um, we will go ahead and get the uh, information up there and I'll go through that and then we'll just give that a minute. And I can't imagine that anybody's paying too close attention to us tonight since we're just doing a presentation from, <coughs> excuse me, Affordable Housing Trust Fund and Resident Oversight Committee. So if there is anybody that would like to call in and make a comment on anything outside of tonight's agenda, um, you can call in for cell phone users. That is 1-213-338-8477. And if you're on a landline, that's 1-877-853-5357. The webinar ID is 842-9399-6424, and the password is 999636. 
and uh, we'll just go ahead and see if anybody joins in here. And uh, can't imagine that we will have anybody, but we'll give folks a minute just in case. I do see there's one attendee in the attendees bin, or I don't, what do you call that? I don't know what you call that. Mm -hmm. All righty, I think that's long enough. Um, for some reason, somebody jumps on and tries to chime in, maybe we'll give them an opportunity to do that, but Excuse me, I think for now we will close that public comment period and move on to the next line item on the agenda, which is staff announcements, which I don't believe we have any. And we don't have any public hearings tonight, so we will move on to communications and special presentations. Um, tonight we have the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and Resident Oversight Committee and um, is it just Riley that's presenting? Or Emily Harris, actually? Hi, okay. I'm gonna present first and then Riley's going to present second. Okay. Um, could we please promote Riley? He's in the attendees right now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Heather, would you uh, mind uh, taking care of that? Yeah, you should be rejoining as a panelist momentarily. I, I see them there. Um, in the panelist section. Thanks for that, Emily, pointing that out, Emily. Okay, Emily, you've got the floor. Take it away. Thank you. I'm uh, recognizing that it might be a little noisy where I am right now, but um, I think that will go away <laughs> in just a second. Um, so thanks so much for having us tonight. I'm Emily Harris Shears. I am the Housing Policy Specialist with the City of Missoula's Community Development Division, and I work uh, on implementing a place to call home, the citywide housing policy, as well as uh, oversee the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And we're really appreciative to be here tonight and get to share about the work we've been doing in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and the Oversight Committee uh, spaces. So. Um, I already introduced myself and Riley will get to introduce himself uh, in a bit. Uh, um, so I just want to kind of center our conversation and discussion in a place to call home, which is, as I mentioned, the city's uh, comprehensive housing policy and it was adopted in uh, 2019. And the purpose is really to provide a guiding document for our goals and plans around the housing market and um, stock and the needs of our community related to housing. Uh, the housing the housing policy is organized into four uh, focus areas. Uh, track and analyze progress for continuous improvement, align and leverage existing funding resources to support housing, partnering to create and preserve affordable homes, and reducing barriers to new supply and promoting access to affordable homes. Um, and as you can see, we um, I highlighted a few things that we've done in each uh, category to start to build progress toward our goals. And one of the biggest uh, milestones that we've met so far is adopting the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in July of 2020, which at the time was the only Affordable Housing Trust Fund in the state. Now we are um, glad to be joined by Helena in that work uh, and be able to collaborate with them as well. Um, so the Affordable Housing Trust Fund was adopted in July of 2020, and I started in October of 2020, and my tasks were really to start the foundation and implementation of that work, which included um, 
creating and seating the oversight committee, as well as writing the policies and procedures and the grant making strategy for the trust fund. So the affordable housing trust fund, um, you know, really is overseen and guided by the ordinance that was adopted in July of 2020, which outlines the purpose, why it was established, how it can be used, what the administration will look like for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and then also that there will be a oversight committee that is not only, uh, their purview is not only the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, but really the greater work of the body of the place to call home. But because that is kind of our central um, strategy at this point, they have done a ton of work to support the implementation and the ongoing um, operation of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So um, you may be familiar with why we have an affordable housing trust fund in the city of Missoula, um, but its intent is really as the city, as Missoula's only local funding source for affordable housing, um, the trust fund is really a dedicated and flexible funding source. The intent and hope of it is that it can be the most flexible funding in a um, finance stack to help a project uh, be able to be completed and funded. Um, we never intend that the trust fund will fund the whole uh, cost of a project. We just don't have the revenue to do that at this time, but we do um, want to, and we are a part of closing those gaps oftentimes so that projects can move forward. Uh, and it also allows for consistency and predictability uh, so that projects can do the long range planning and multi year um, focus work that they need to do in order to pull off these uh, really impressive projects that sometimes have hundreds of units and require a lot of coordination and um, strategy around their financing and their funding. So uh, we have several ways that we can generate revenue for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which includes a minimum allocation from the general fund uh, each year during budget season of $100,000. We also receive the revenue from the sale of city-owned land and assets that are not otherwise dedicated or encumbered to another purpose. We are able to apply for grants, though we do hit a snag sometimes because we are within the city and we're not a 501c3. Um, and so oftentimes foundations or other entities that are offered grants don't allow our application, but we're working through strategies to um, just overcome those kind of rules. Um, like doing a sponsorship with a, another organization or something like that. We can also accept private donations, bequests, and contributions. Um, we will take the principal and interest payments made by borrowers of the trust fund back into the trust fund and reuse it for another investment. Um, similarly, if there are any fines or penalties of, imposed during a um, loan or grant term from the trust fund, we'll recoup those back into the trust fund and reinvest them. And then um, if there are other funds that are identified as suitable, those can be added as well. A great example of that uh, this year is the uh, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act funding, which is a considerable portion of our award from this year. So uh, the trust fund has many allowable activities, uh, which includes um, purchasing of land for the construction of affordable housing or um, a project that was recently taken to council is the purchase of land under an existing apartment complex that will then become a community land trust and protect the affordability of that. Uh, housing structure in perpetuity. That's an acquisition, an example of an acquisition where um, at the time of sale, there was potential for those units that were naturally occurring as affordable housing to become potentially unaffordable depending on who purchased them. And um, with the support of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, they were able to acquire that land and they used a partner 
to acquire the building um, as well. So it's a great example of a public and private partnership. Um, then really any kind of um, cost that is associated with the construction or preservation of housing that is affordable uh, for a period of time can be used for uh, from the affordable housing trust fund. So that also looks like consumer housing programs and services. We currently fund the Centralized Housing Solutions Fund, which is a flexible fund uh, available for people who are ending their experiences of home, uh, houselessness or at risk of experiencing houselessness and need one-time funding to um, bridge the cost gap of moving into new housing or a deposit or things like that, or to stay up to date on their rent. Um, we also fund projects like that. Um, and then uh, no more than 8% of the total revenue that's added to the trust fund each year can be dedicated to our administrative costs. So that includes our salaries and other operating expenses. So uh, this year we ran a funding round in partnership with the Community Development Block Grant Funds and the Home Investment Partnership Funds. And uh, we recommended four projects for award from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, and those include the North Missoula Community Development Corporation's Wolf Street Project. That's the example I was just giving of purchasing the land under two apartment buildings and an adjacent home to convert to a CLT or a housing co-op and preserve affordability. We also invested in the Habitat for Humanity uh, project of acquiring and placing two modular homes in East Missoula on a parcel that Habitat owns. Um, and this is uh, protecting and securing affordability for two uh, Missoulians whose home, their uh, area median income is below uh, 80% area median income. So oftentimes there are not a lot of home ownership opportunities at that AMI level. And so this is a really exciting project as well. We're also recommending the funding uh, for Homewards Home Ownership Center programs, which provide financial and housing education counseling. Uh, and then finally, the Rivara Scott Street Community Land Trust project. Uh, and this, I just want to note, this project uh, was recommended by the scoring committee, and they are currently finalizing their design. So until their design is finalized, their recommendation is not being taken to council. We want to confirm that the intent of the original application and design stays um, consistent. So we've been working in partnership with them and hope to take that sometime in the fall. So just looking ahead at what's um, to come, both in a place to call home and the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, we are um, working to develop our voluntary incentives program which will provide just what it sounds like, incentives to developers in order to um, create stronger partnerships and really incent development that um, can be affordable. This most likely will include a percentage of affordable units in a uh, market rate or mixed rate um, building, which is also a really exciting opportunity in our community to have more um, mixed income and mixed rate units and buildings. Uh, we're also looking to develop the accessory dwelling program, accessory dwelling unit program, uh, which will essentially help um, homeowners be able to use some kind of subsidy to develop an accessory dwelling unit in exchange for um, a voucher preference likely so that we can uh, both spur gentle infill and also uh, prioritize people with limited incomes and vouchers, which we know um, utilizing vouchers is a challenging uh, exercise for many people in our community. And so this may be one solution, but that is a very uh, preliminary exploration that we're doing right now around how we would um, ultimately design that program. We're also doing actively some housing displacement research and policy work. We know that the market is very challenging for renters, especially renters that are, um, you know, at or below 80, 100 to 80 percent AMI, um, that people are experiencing the end of their 
lease terms and then not being renewed in those lease terms, that their rents are being raised. Sometimes today I heard $300 from their previous lease term, um, you know, that people are having a hard time staying in the housing that they're in. There's also fear of um, like needing things from their landlords and then having you know, outcomes of them not being renewed in their leases when they expire. And so we're doing some listening sessions with the community now to really understand what people are experiencing and then um, simultaneously working to um, develop recommendations around policy and programmatic responses that could help uh, support primarily renters in our community. Uh, and then we're also looking and building our capitalization strategies, which build toward our uh, five-year goal of uh, raising $10 million to um, sort of be a revolving loan and grant fund for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is outlined in our funding resolution. So the last thing I want to highlight is the Affordable Housing Resident Oversight Committee, which uh, began meeting in June of 2021. Uh, and it's a 10 voting member committee with two alternates. And the alternates participate fully in discussion and, um, and share their insight. And then when someone is absent or we have a vacancy, they fill in as a voting member. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Riley Jacobson, who's our chair, but just want to say that but for the um, work, I think very similarly of your um, body and your board that, but for their work, we, we likely wouldn't be as far as we are in the implementation of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. They've provided really uh, great and important insight and advocacy. And I'm really excited that they are, that Riley's joined too to share a little bit more and highlight some local data as well. So Riley, I can keep driving the PowerPoint if you want to jump on. That would be awesome uh, because I have a tendency to somehow mess up PowerPoints. So <laughs> thank you, Emily. Um, first off, let me just say I'm super stoked to be here and be doing this presentation. Uh, I didn't even know that a planning board existed. And the more that I learn about community and like housing and the projects and how things work, the more that I get excited because my heart goes, oh, well, there's a lot of people working on this. It's not just some like vague issue where it's like, what do we do? Is it all dollar signs? No, it it's people are helping people and it's actually a doable thing. Um, so I guess we'll jump into it because I could riff on people helping people all day. So... <laughs> Uh, recently, ROC and the subcommittee that's attached to it started collecting some data. We had a really good presentation by Paul Herendeen, uh, where a lot of these figures come from. So the mean average two-bedroom apartment rent was $1,146 in 2022, and that comes from the Missoula Organization of Realtors. As you can see, there's this pretty significant upward trend in housing prices, right? A four bedroom, you know, plus house went from a little more than $1,000 in 2012 and continued to rise. 2020 pandemic happened. And since then, in the last year, it skyrocketed to about $1,800. Um, I think the really important figures in this is if we look at the studio in one bedroom housing, which I would consider in my line of work affordable. That's what most people are probably going for with vouchers or lower income or SSI and SSDI and disability and all of that significantly rose to a rate that if we look at one bedroom apartments, 800, say 875, well, that's more than most vouchers are going to cover. Um, it's more than most people get a month for social security and disability, which is basically saying that folks who can't work due to medical conditions can't even afford an apartment, which causes them to experience housing insecurity and kind of enter this bubble where there are no solutions. And it's not necessarily this like big, vague thing. It's just, we don't have affordable housing stock. Uh, you go to the next slide, Emily. Thank you. So here's another great graph. Uh, in quarter one of 2022, the vacancy rate was reported as 0.9%. MOR indicates that a healthy vacancy rate is between five to eight percent. So again, it's kind of the same trend. Uh, we're seeing a healthy market rate here between five to eight. And in 2018, in the first quarter, we had that, right? 
But as we continue to move into the pandemic and continue to go throughout the year to where we're at 2022, it's almost like we don't have any vacancies, um, which, I mean, is a significant thing, right? We have folks who work in the community who can't afford their housing or they're being priced out. We have people who have lived in the state who want to move here because, I mean, I'll say it, Missoula rocks. We have a great community. We have wonderful resources. The arts are here. We have a river that runs through it. Definitely quote it. Robert Redford there. Um, but we don't have housing. We don't have anywhere for anyone to even move to. So it leads to this whole issue of how do we grow? How do we build? Um, and quite frankly, for our numbers to be that low is pretty drastic. Emily, would you go to the next slide, please? So yes, let me move my little course here. Uh, the combined sold and median price for selected unit types in our urban district. As you can see, it's kind of the same trend, right? Where it's the units sold are going up, the price is going up, and then we don't have availability. Uh, the median housing price is $500,000. And I get it, I get that things increase, that there's inflation, but if we're looking at AMI, which last year was listed as $80,000, and then realistically looking at those numbers, who can afford a house in this community right now? Um, I know for most of the folks that I work with, like that's an unattainable thing. I myself, I'm, I'm in a lower generation um, and like the American dream, right? Used to be like, you go to college, you get out of college, you get a house with the white picket fence, you have stability, you start a family, you move into the future. I would say that that is the American pipe dream at this point. Um, it's not a realistic goal for most people to own a home, let alone even think about what home ownership looks like at these prices, let alone even try to fathom what that could be in a, as aggressive as a market as we're seeing with the lack of housing stock that we have. Would you go to the next slide? You. So yeah, talking about AMI, um, if you line up every household in the region, from the one making the least to the one making the most, the household in the middle would be the median household. Um, I mean, we got a stat here, right? 80,000. $200. A family making approximately that could afford a house priced around $340,000. However, we don't have a lot of houses even in that price range. Um, and quite frankly, that's a lot of money, y'all. Honestly, I would say that a big factor is for people who are below AMI, which I would say is significantly most of the community is probably not making anywhere near $80,000 a year combined. Um, and so that really leaves this question, what do we do about our affordable housing? How do, we, how do we make it more accessible for people who are living and working within Missoula and aren't necessarily making this much, who are below the 80% AMI limit? Next slide. So yeah, why are we here? I, you know, why, why does ARC exist? Why are we in these awesome positions where we have access to this data, where there are planning boards, where the work is being done and the data is being collected? Um, for our subcommittee and as a committee, we, we dig and we understand that planning decisions must include a variety of factors, including traffic, public space, environmental impact, and design, to name a few. Given the above data that underscores the critical point we have reached in our local housing market, we encourage the planning board to give appropriately proportional pool, <laughs> proportional weight to housing supply considerations when making decisions. As the Affordable Housing Resident Oversight Committee, we look forward to collaboration opportunities with you when to when addressing development questions. Um, I think really what this boils down to y'all is we as a committee are having these conversations right around our affordable housing and we're gathering the data and we're trying to reach out to every sector that we work with. Ultimately though, that's our role, right? Is we, we can suggest these policy, these policy improvements. We can look at these developments. However, in my heart of hearts, I know that things work better when we all as Missoulians, as people who live within this community, utilize our platforms, we utilize our knowledge, our resources, the people that we know to solve this issue, because it very much is a community issue. It's not just an issue of people who don't have homes and people who do have homes or people who can get financing from banks. Like we all live here. It's all of our responsibility, especially the responsibility of those of us who are public servants to begin utilizing what we know and the connections that we have and the positions that we hold to help create a better Missoula. Um, 
I mean, I myself, I've lived here off and on for 10 years. I absolutely love it here. I love waking up in the morning and looking out and seeing the mountains and then seeing the river that runs through our town and then like downtown tonight where there's a bunch of jam and music, then the smiling faces. And I very much want everyone to have access to that and to know the Missoula that I love, right? That friendly place that we all call home. Um, on the flip side, in my day-to-day -day affairs, like I work with people who the only way that they have access to housing is through vouchers, is through SSI and SSDI. And at this current market, like that's, it's not a very obtainable thing unless we have more affordable housing stock. Um, I wanna reference a story now of a veteran who had housing and up until about two months ago, he was content in his housing. He lived in it for a number of years. He was able to afford his rent and due to the rising market costs and the decision of his landlord, they priced him out of his unit. So then this vet who, who served our country, who for all intents and purposes was living the life that he earned, had to start staying at the authorized camping site. And granted, we have service providers and people who are doing outreach to go down there and help, but there's no reason why that gentleman should have to experience houselessness after serving his country, after having a place and being able to afford it. And this very much is a result of the current housing market. And so while I can't sit here and be like, boom, here's, you know, ABC, these are the solutions. I will sit here and say, if we can all work together on finding a common ground and working on a good solution, I think that'll go a long way. And honestly, like we just need more affordable housing. I think we're all feeling it, we're all seeing it. And so the more that we can communicate and work together, I feel like the better it will be in the long run, not just for us, but all the people who do wanna call Missoula home. Outstanding. Uh, thank you, Emily and Riley. That was uh, a very informative and uh, well, almost passionate, I would say, um, and I appreciate that passion. Um, board members, does anybody have any questions? I'd like to open up the floor for you all to uh, ask questions. Um, so go ahead and raise your hands up and um, I will uh, give you the guys the floor. Go ahead, Micah. Yeah, first, um, just thank you to you both for um, coming and talking to us about this because it's something that we, it comes up and we need more resources and we need more conversations around it. Um, and I think we all probably know somebody who has been, um, you know, not had their rent or not had their lease renewed or has been required to leave their house because it's being turned into a short-term rental or the rent is being increased by more than they can afford. Um, I know that I've heard way too many stories like that um, from friends and, and people that I know in town. Um, and so I guess I wanted to ask, um, we've talked with, I think it was with the county about um, the impact of, of short-term uh, rentals um, on the housing market. And um, it sounds like there's really a lack of information. Um, like we don't know how many short-term rentals there are. So we don't even have the steps in place if we wanted to regulate them in some way. Um, and I was just wanted to hear from you all. Is that something that's under your purview? Is that something that you're doing research into um, or that you're helping coordinate with the city um, or even with the county um, as I know that they've been talking about working on that? Riley, I'll take that one. Is that cool? <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for the question. So we hear that as well. And um, council last year uh, allocated one-time funding to be able to work with a um, short-term rental um, vendor to kind of learn about the scope of the project, the problem. Uh, and so that's work that we've been doing this year. And we are working on a report right now that should be done by um, probably mid-June. And then we'll share that with council. And then once it's shared with council, then we'll be able to share it with other uh, entities as well. So yes, it is something that we hear and we hear examples of it happening. Um, and we also did need to understand the scope of the problem uh, and the size of, you know, how many rentals, how many vacation or short-term rentals there are and what that is doing to our housing stock. Um, so that's work that we're actively uh, focused on right now.
Great, thank you, Emily. And then I have Tung and then Dory. Hi, yeah, thanks for that um, presentation. Very informative and uh, a little bit sobering as well. Um, in terms of your, uh, the, um, I have a kind of a two-part question um, with respect to the, your your restrictions on how you can use your funds. Um, and uh, are you able to do any type of outreach or, or advocacy uh, as part of your budget? Um, and, and the reason why I'm asking that is kind of the second part of my question, or maybe a request is, I think one of the challenges that we have with affordable housing as a whole and um, is just awareness. I think people can hear about the headlines quite a bit and the stories that we tell is are very compelling, but I don't think people truly understand the scope of the issue. And I think that one of the things that would be great, and I don't know if you are the body to do this, would be to help educate the rest of the community um, on what the problem is and the scope of the problem. And more importantly, on the long-term impact, um, the story about the veteran is, is heartbreaking, but there are other stories of teachers, of uh, policemen, of uh, other sort of middle income folks who can't afford housing, and that's part of the problem as well. And I don't think people realize that and that the long term impact that's going to have on Missoula and Missoula's continued growth. So as an example, in our work in the planning board, we get a lot of very contentious issues and more often than not, we're hearing primarily from people directly involved in or who will be directly impacted by a given, you know, rezone or development. We rarely hear at the planning board level, the other side, if you will, in terms of uh, housing advocates. So I'm just curious if that's something that is A, within your purview and B, if something you are planning on doing. So we have limitations as a city entity on the um, role we play in things like advocacy, though we can always provide education and engagement to the community member to the community. Um, one of the strategies in our capitalization plan is to do uh, community engagement events so that we can start to social, socialize both that we have an affordable housing trust fund um, and the scopes of the problems and why we need something like an affordable housing trust fund and what it can ultimately do. Um, we can absolutely fund projects that would like to do uh, organization or outreach to people who would benefit from um, programs that are funded or developed by the trust fund that would fall under consumer housing services. So while it may not be directly city staff doing that work, um, it is something that would be eligible to be funded to an organization. And we've talked with a few organizations about that as well. And then I don't wanna speak for Riley, but I'll just tee up that um, that's also the scope uh, and one of the uh, roles that the oversight committee is starting to take on and use some of their voice around um, you know, supporting projects and showing up at spaces. They recently went, a few members recently shared public comment around the Grant Creek Expo and they have other plans to do that. They formed a subcommittee. So um, I think that that's work is getting started. Riley, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I wanna, I kinda wanna touch upon the, the consumer housing services portion of the trust fund and what that really impacts. Um, so I, I work in the housing nonprofit sector at the Pavarello Center and a, a big part of the fund that we all access as service providers, whether that's the Salvation Army, the YWCA, Western Montana Mental Health Center's PATH program, Hope Rescue Mission, and a bunch of other nonprofit service providers who seek to uh, aid those who are experiencing housing security is a centralized housing solution fund. And this fund directly goes to helping cover, you know, rental deposits and security deposits and getting people IDs and helping with transportation assistance and really anything and everything that we can find a creative use for to aid those who may have lost their job due to a breakdown of a relationship. And then due to losing their job, they couldn't make their car payment and then their car got repossessed and then they lost their home and now they're accessing services at the shelter. And so there's a lot of outreach uh, that we do on our end in regards to being housing nonprofits that are directly tied to this fund which comes from the trust fund. And I think really, as with anything else that happens, 
it's all about communication. I mean, the more that we all talk about affordable housing and these resources that we have available, like the trust fund, the more that people hear about them, and then the more that we all can work together to finding a solution. Great, thank you. Outstanding. Um, I have Dory up next and then Josh and Shane after that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Emily and Riley. Great to hear from you. I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, I've talked to Emily a number of times, but Riley, it's first time sort of meeting you. So great to meet you and thank you for the important work you're doing. Um, I have a couple of questions um, and then maybe a comment for the board as well. Um, so one, Emily, I'm curious, um, I know that um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund was involved with Missoula Gives this year through the Missoula Community Foundation. Um, I'd love to know more about how that went for you because it that certainly was um, an opportunity to raise public awareness. You know, there's just so much public awareness around that campaign and it was great to see the Affordable Housing Trust Fund as part of it and I wonder, um, you know, what kind of money uh, you were able to generate through that. Um, and maybe I'll have you answer that and then I'll ask my other questions since it's not really related. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, we, it was great. It was a really great way to, um, like one of our main goals, which was to socialize the trust fund and uh, tell people that we even have one in the city. And that definitely was achieved. We raised just uh, a little over $5,000. Um, so we're happy with that. It was uh, a little bit lower than our goal, but it was our first year, so we weren't quite sure what to expect. Mm -hmm. Something we also learned is that we don't necessarily have all the infrastructure that nonprofits traditionally have uh, as a city entity, and so that's something that we'll plan to work around for next year. Awesome. Um, thank you. That's great. Yeah. And I think hopefully that will sort of gain some traction over time too. I think, I think it probably will. Um, another thing I want to mention maybe more for the greater board, cause I, I have brought this up with Emily in the past, but when we as a board looked at two of the recent subdivision proposals, the one on Greeno drive and river road, I really started thinking about how, um, I think, and based on what I've read about what's happening in Boise, Idaho, that it would be great for us to find more ways to work with developers early in the process to, you know, look at, you know, affordability as a component of all of these developments that we're seeing, you know, and where there is subsidy available to integrate into a 19 unit subdivision you know, two or three units that can be affordable at various levels, I think that's a, a much more economical way for both developers to be involved and also a really smart way for us to use the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in smaller chunks to get affordable housing more integrated around the community. Um, and I just want to mention that I've inquired about that um, with Emily in the past, and it sounds like it is the intent of, of their staff to start, you know, figuring out how to get involved earlier in the process with developers, because, you know, these proposals come before us and, you know, affordability, unfortunately, isn't a criteria we can make decisions based on um, with these developments. And that's frustrating for me, um, because we do have a lot of things happening around town, but they're not necessarily affordable. Um, but I do also recognize that, you know, adding more supply is is a good thing um, overall as well. Um, and then the last thing I just want to mention that I heard recently. Um, so I guess the mayor is hosting monthly kind of community talks and he wasn't able to attend the last one, but it was on, um, you know, um, houselessness in Missoula. Um, and one of the things that came up and it was the first time I heard it and I just want to mention it because I do think it should be something that more people are aware of is that um, it was mentioned by one of the staff that um, you know sometimes there are there is housing available uh, for lower income members of our community and unfortunately there are uh, property owners um, and property management companies unwilling to rent to those individuals even though some of the resources may be available uh, through state and federal support and I think that's something. Um, you know, I, I think we need to find ways that we can work together better to, to address some of those needs in our community. So I just wanted, want to mention that and continue to help raise awareness about it. Thanks. Great, thank you, Dory. Outstanding questions. And thanks for that update. Um, Josh and then Shane. Thank you, Riley and Ellen, for that presentation. Um, my questions are more about kind of how the funds can be used. Um, and where in the capital stack do you see the trust fund 
um, deploying capital to have the, the biggest benefit and really move the needle with, with creators of new product. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really project dependent in that um, we are trusting the developer or the project leads to know when the time is right for them to apply. Um, and right now we're doing um, one competitive cycle and then we also hold a up to 20% of the um, annual balance in a reserve for projects that are emergent or um, would otherwise like we would lose affordable housing if we didn't act quickly um, between cycles. So we know sometimes that projects are applying a little bit earlier than they need the funding, um, but because it, if they're approved and recommended, then that's secure for their stack and that's helping quite a lot. Um, and so we just really kind of look to their expertise and their where they are in their projects. Um, so, you know, I think that we'll just kind of start to learn that a little bit more as we go to, um, depending on the projects that we are working on. The two, um, the Homeward, or excuse me, the Habitat for Humanity project uh, is not doing any other additional fun financing. They're doing in-kind and uh, um, basically an in-kind donation on the price of the modular home. So the only uh, capital they're using is the trust funds investment to place those two homes. Uh, and then the North Missoula Community Development Corporation's project is similar in that they are uh, they negotiated a price of $340,000 to purchase the land under those homes um, to bring them into permanent affordability. So those also are not uh, utilizing additional financing. And those are our best uh, capital project examples at this point. Oh, and then the Ravara project, which we'll take to council later this year, um, that is intended to be a loan and it will go into their capital stack, but um, will help close the loop. And the um, their loan, their bank knows that they've been recommended for it and that has helped in some of their conversations, I believe. Does that, does that well, answer your it, question? It, it does a little bit. So they can come in and acquire the land under affordable housing so that the developer can then lower their basis, presumably, and offer that housing on a permanently affordable basis. I get that. Um, I guess my question was more um, a, a, you know, how the capital comes in. Does it come in as first lien debt? Is it mezzanine debt? Can it be preferred mm. equity? Can it be limited partner joint venture equity and realize a return alongside a general partner or developer, for example? Does it play all up and down the capital stack? And I guess this is getting a little bit yeah. <laughs> financy, but um, I think it's important because there's different risk associated with where that capital is deployed in the stack and the potential returns, of course, should be commensurate with that risk. Um, and there may be places within the stack where the trust fund can get the biggest bang for their buck and experience more positive asymmetric risk return balance. So I, I saw there was one finance professional in the subcommittee. Um, Presumably, that person's helping guide the trust fund and you know, the primary capital and how to how to price it appropriately and, and and get it out the door so that it has the biggest impact. Yeah, that's true. Um, Paul has been Paul Herendine from Clearwater has been a great resource um, in this work. I will say, you know, we are we kept our loan language and our policies intentionally vague so that the project could really direct what they need, whether they need me mezzanine or um, like, and we can be flexible to that within the city and write the loan terms depending on uh, what's going on with the rest of the stack. We may find that we need to uh, formalize that a bit as we go, but for now we um, are really trying to lean into that flexibility and um, we do want to 
get a return on the capital that we're investing, but we also make grants that will not come back to us. And so our priority really is to see uh, projects in our community that without an investment from the trust fund may not be possible. That's really our goal, um, at least at this time. Got it, thank you. That's very cool. I mean, I think there's to be some really creative and innovative partnerships that could be, you know, that could happen um, where the trust fund could maybe have you know, major decision input on some of those projects. So that's cool. Yeah, great. Work. Thank you. All right, thank you, Josh. And Shane, you're up. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess maybe I'll start with a comment. Um, I, I really did enjoy the uh, the idea of, you know, trying to um, incentivize ADU development. Um, that seems like it would be a really positive way to get, uh, you know, a good mix of incomes within existing communities and also uh, densify. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, was wondering if there's a way to, um, you know, potentially make it a, you know, a, a, a loan, like, you know, cr use a, uh, a loan program for development of ADUs uh, based on forgiveness or something like that, you know, if you, uh, make make the ADU permanently affordable for 20 years, you know, or 10 years or whatever, your loan essentially is forgiven or for every year up until that point. Um, just throwing that out there, I don't think I need an answer, but just kind of um, thought that I'd, uh, I thought that that, that was interesting. Um, uh, I guess maybe to touch on uh, Tung's and Dory's uh, comments a little bit. Um, you know, I think that, and I, I think I mentioned this in our uh, meeting, Emily, uh, when uh, you and Sean and I met uh, a little while back, but I'm wondering if the way to get, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Funds, um, you know, comments is through like subdivision review or zoning review where we get um, you know, we always get, uh, you know, fire department review. We always get uh, wastewater review. We always get, uh, you know, city water review to make sure that all those services are lined out. And I'm wondering if there's a way, you know, just a, you know, a spot for you folks to be able to make a comment on, uh, on those things to be able to convey to us rather than showing up to every, you know, meeting and saying, yeah, this is a really good, uh, you know, project. Uh, that's, this is a really terrible project. Um, you know, just so that I, I, it feels like there's a lot of weight that we, you know, we put a lot of weight in those comments, I think. And just reflecting back on some of the things that we've reviewed in the last little bit here, it's, been, you know, kind of close votes and, you know, a good comment might be able to um, swing it a little bit. And I think that that also incentivizes developers to talk to you guys early uh, and, you know, uh, hey, we're going to we're going to include affordable housing. We'd love it if you guys put in a good word uh, in our subdivision review, something like that. And, and that might not be a question either. It might be a city staff, uh, you know, uh, thing, but uh, just something to think about. Um, and then I guess maybe my only real question is, is uh, the $10 million goal over five years. And uh, um, just curious how that number was arrived at. Is there like a certain amount? Is, is that a number that we feel is sustainable to, uh, be able to make enough interest off of it to be able to, you know, make an appropriate amount of investment in the community, and uh, or is it is that just seed money? You know, just kind of curious about that. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for your comments. I really appreciate um, both of them very much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to nerd out for a second and talk about revenue strategies and say that um, they 
I believe it was before my time, but I believe that uh, the consultant who helped inform the housing policy helped really kind of um, arrive at that $10 million number, um, which is called a corpus. So it's kind of our like set pot of funding. And once we reach that, the intent is that we would not award um, $10 million annually. We would um, do about $3 million annually and then be on a cycle of um, loan payments and interest and all of those pieces coming back into the trust fund to be able to, by the time we're at our next cycle, have some of that money replenished and have it, you know, continuously from each award year replenishing at a rate. We also know that we will make grants and so that money will not replenish at all. So we will have to continue to um, seek out additional funding as the depending on what the depletion rate looks like. Um, and that really is gonna be situational based on the projects that come in and that um, kind of on a year to year or maybe two year projection basis. So it's just something that we don't quite know yet. Um, but the, the plan is that we will um, kind of use that $3 million as an annual allocation amount. The other thing I'll say is that we're in this interesting space where we're doing two strategies at once. We're trying to make cases for the efficacy of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So the entirety of the allocation we're receiving in council each fiscal year, we're um, planning to award out um, so that we can get some projects in our portfolio. And then we also are actively doing revenue building strategies so that we can reach that $10 million corpus. And then when we get there, and we haven't been awarded $3 million yet in our allocations, but once we get there, then we can chill out a little bit and just do that like uh, kind of more planful revenue building rather than what we're doing right now, which is uh, a bulk of it. Does that help? It does. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that all sounds great. I mean, the, the only thing that makes me a little bit nervous is, uh, you know, I, I really want this thing to succeed. And I want you guys to have as much money as humanly possible to uh, uh, make a dent in it. And, you know, if, if it costs $300,000 to build one affordable unit, uh, then we're really talking about, you know, 10 units a year. Uh, with that allocation, which is um, just, there, it's not that much. So like looking at alternative investments to spur uh, other people to, you know, not funding full projects is, uh, se seems very smart and just giving the right amount of, you know, money here or there to incentivize others uh, to do it uh, will hopefully make that somewhat exponential, so. Can I respond to that too? Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that the framing that the federal government has used around the home investment partnership and the community development block grant funding being um, like gap financing for projects has been a really great um, model for us in thinking about like you're saying, not being the primary investment, though in these small cir circumstances we are, um, but like in these Villaggio type buildings, we will not be the primary investor. There's no way. And so, but the, the investment we can make is still really meaningful. Um, and then I think the other space where we will gain units is by doing those simultaneous strategies like accessory dwelling units and, um, They've, the voluntary incentives with developers where those may not be, those will likely not be formally funded by the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, but they'll be within our kind of housing policy budget and ability to do, you know, multiple strategies to put more units in the community. All right, great discussion, folks. Is there anybody else that has any questions at this time? All right, not seeing any hands going up. I'm gonna go ahead and ask my questions. Um, 
So my first question is, is I'm kind of curious about um, your guys' uh, ability to collaborate and work with uh, organizations like Homeward or Neighbor Works, um, because I know that, you know, they are also like working diligently on this issue. So I'm kind of curious about your guys' ability to collaborate with them. On a, like an education component or on a funding and project component? Anything, anything, okay. Yeah, they're uh, specifically Homeward and NeighborWorks are great partners of the city and the community development division and of the work we're doing in the trust fund, um, Habitat, HRC. Um, I'm going to leave people out, which is unfortunate. Pavarello Center, I would say all of our housing focused nonprofit partners are excellent. Um, collaborators with us and really stay engaged with the work that the community development division is doing um, and inform a lot of what we're doing uh, for our planning purposes as well. And they were, uh, all of those partners were integral in the adoption and development of the A Place to Call Home housing policy, as well as the ordinance language and the resolution language for the trust fund. So it truly um, they were before my time in the city, but my understanding is that they are really community-centered documents that reflect the goals and needs of those partners and the challenges that they're facing around housing development. So yes, we absolutely partner with them. Um, two projects, the Trinity and the Villaggio, which are Homeward and Missoula Housing Authority projects, um, applied during this round. We did a unified round where we um, utilized home community development block grant and trust fund dollars. And then um, we took all applications and then we looked at sort of the right proportion of funding and recommend and went back and said, we think you should take this funding source. Is that okay with you? And um, the Villaggio and the Trinity were both recommended for funding through home and the community development uh, block grant. So those are also being invested in as well. Nice, that is, uh, that's great to hear that you guys are able to collaborate on that, that level. Um, and so I, I don't think I have any more questions at this time. Does, does anybody else on the board have a question for um, Emily or Riley? Not seeing any more hands up. So I just want to make a couple of, of comments, I think, here um, before we let Emily and Riley go. Um, so one thing I want to throw out there for um, board members is the idea that we've talked about a subcommittee around affordable housing and um, to encourage everybody to consider that idea and whether that's something we want to kind of resurrect um and what that would look like and what the effort would be um and then the other um note i had here was that um i uh went to a training semi recently um and put on by homeward and uh neighborhood works and it was part of that training where i got an a not necessarily official update but to let everybody know that the city is almost ready to announce that they are going to be working on rezoning um, a, a zoning update, uh, updating the code. Um, and that's not official yet. At some point we should get a presentation on that, but I've been wanting to let everybody know that. Um, and this seems like a, a good opportunity to do that. Um, and so I think with that, if nobody else has any hands to go up, I will um, go ahead and say, I think, I think we're wrap this part up and thank you very much, Emily and Riley for your guys' presentation. Oh, wait, there was one other thing that I wanted to say um, and just to encourage and um, I guess I would like to maybe try and do this again um, and I don't know what the best time frame that for that is, whether 
whether like every six months or um, a yearly update uh, is more appropriate. But I'd like to encourage you guys to reach out to us when you guys think it's appropriate um, for updates, because I think we would all um, very much appreciate that. Um, and actually, I see that Ellie has her hand up. Um, um, so go ahead, Ellie. Thanks for letting me sneak in there. I just wonder if, would, would it make sense to have, like we have to go to like the TPCC meetings and then kind of report back that would it make sense for this committee to have a person from planning board just attending the meetings to provide any like updates? I don't know if that's the model that we'd want to adopt, but in, instead of having to always say like, okay, when when's the right time for you guys to come back? But like that there's just a presence there that kind of crosses both boards. Just an idea. Um, absolutely. I am open to that. And um, I think that is something that we can uh, discuss further tonight for sure um, and see how folks are feeling. Um, and definitely appreciate that suggestion. I think uh, right now, though, we can um, we can probably let Emily and Riley go um, and call it an evening, and then we can wrap up and have a little more discussion, and then move on with the uh, meeting. So, unless there is any more questions for Emily or Riley, um, I'd just like to thank both of you for your, your time and being here and making this presentation. I think this is something that everybody on the board recognizes as a uh, important um, issue to be looking at and trying to tackle in whatever ways we can. So thank you both for being here. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good evening. All right, so um, do you guys want to have, um, you know, the agenda is pretty straightforward. We have some old business to review that, that letter about um, Highway 93. Do you guys want to have a little discussion amongst ourselves right now and um, hash out this idea of about a subcommittee or we could do it in new business? Um, I don't think it really matters really a lot as far as the agenda goes for tonight. Um, so how are you guys feeling? What do you think? Any suggestions? Does it need to be on an agenda so public comment can be made or not? Um, I don't believe so. I don't, um, I don't believe for us to have an internal discussion about uh, the idea of uh, creating a subcommittee needs to um, be out there for public comment. I think public review, um, absolutely. Um, but, you know, and staff, please chime in here if you have any uh, recommendations. I think, I think we're fairly open to talk about this, you know, now or we can, you know, put it at new business and talk about it in a couple of minutes. Um, if I may, um, I think having a discussion tonight, perfectly all right. If you do want to make a motion, that would probably be best to add to agenda in the future, um, since you would be making a vote on whether or not to actually form the subcommittee or potentially um, your other option that was uh, broached tonight would be just having a member of planning board attend some of those uh, committee meetings, if that could be arranged. Um, also, when it comes to a subcommittee, all of your public noticing, your meeting minutes, everything that applies to your full board meetings apply to the subcommittee. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, we don't have the capacity to staff it. So if you do decide to go that route, you would have subcommittee members who would be responsible for those details as well. So there may be an easier or perhaps a little more daunting path forward, um, just to keep those things in mind as, as you discuss it. But if you do wanna make a motion and a vote, um, I recommend adding that to the next agenda under new business probably, um, just, to, just to be safe that way. So it can be, can be noticed on the agenda. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Heather. Those are um, all good points. Um, Dory, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Heather. I, I went to the training yesterday, the board training that Rick was there as well. And I was going to say the exact same thing that Heather said. So that may be just something for us to consider. I like Ellie's idea about us doing something similar to what we do with uh, transportation, where, you know, if one of us is willing to attend meetings, I mean, it certainly seems to me like it's fundamentally important for us to to be aware of what's happening uh, with affordable housing work vis-a-vis -vis all of the proposals for development that we have before us, even though I know, you know, in terms of how the law works, we can't necessarily make decisions based on that, but I think finding ways to be on top of it and, um, you know, where there are opportunities to be talking to developers about it, I think it's super important right now. It's the most important thing, really. So I like that idea, maybe about one of us doing that. Outstanding. Go ahead, Shane. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess the only thing I was going to say is I, I think the only real difference is, is that, you know, um, Tung is a voting member of the TPCC. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's it, it's a real committee, uh, you know, staffed with, uh, you know, uh, and we, we do have some say over it. I think the, the only we would be an observer um, if we were to go to uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund uh, meetings, which I'm not saying is a bad thing. Um, I also did notice on their um, charter that there was an open position. Uh, if anybody wanted to uh, apply for that, potentially, um, uh, that might be a good way to get our foot in the door. That being said, it's not the, the charter does not appear to be that there is always a planning board member on there, which is the status quo with the TPCC right now. So um, I, I do like the idea of kind of keeping it simple and not creating more meetings, uh, I, I suppose. And so uh, it seems like the best thing to do would be to get a member of the planning board that's interested onto that board, and then they can report back. Second best is just to have an observer in the room that, um, uh, can just report back. Great, thank you. Um, and let's see if I can clarify a little bit here. So um, when we did have a subcommittee um, on affordable housing, I'm trying to remember how this was, I, I was brand new onto the board when we, when, when we still had this. Um, and I went to these meetings and I, I want to say part of, you know, maybe a little loophole within the subcommittee was that if we didn't reach a quorum, we were not required to take minutes and do all of those things. And um, we never did. There was, all, there was typically only three of us um, that attended those meetings. And so, you know, that might be you know, a little loophole within that. Um, and I'm not necessarily arguing for a subcommittee. I think uh, the board as a whole should kind of feel this out and see where they're at. Um, I definitely support the idea of having um, somebody, if, if somebody is able to volunteer and attend those meetings. Um, I wonder if we should check in with staff though. Like if somebody, gets onto the board. And I actually kind of thought there was maybe two positions open. I'm not positive about that. Um, but if somebody were to join the board, also being a planning board member, just trying to make sure we don't have any conflicts of interest, you know, coming back and reporting um, and anything in that way. So I, I feel like we should just make sure we double check with um, staff before we, we move on to that um, avenue. And I think that's all I got. Does, does anybody else have any like strong feelings about the idea of a subcommittee or whether or not we should just see if we could find somebody to volunteer and um, attend those meetings so that we can get uh, regular updates? And I don't even know how often they, um, they meet at this point. If anybody does, please chime in. I have uh, Rick and then Micah. Go ahead, Rick. Well, I'm kind of uh, rooting for the latter that somebody just attends informally and reports back. I think it's a lot less likely to be a conflict. 
And uh, I don't know if anyone wants to wants to volunteer. I, I'm on the impact fee advisory board. So if you want to know anything about that board, I'd be happy to report that. But my dance card's kind of full. So great. Awesome. Thank you for that input, Rick. Go ahead, Micah. Yeah, I'm disinclined to say that we should start a subcommittee um, because it doesn't seem like the approach that we need to take. Um, not because I don't think the issue is important. I think we all recognize the importance of, of the issue. But I did want to just ask, um, Sean, since you were once on that subcommittee, I, I don't really understand what the scope or the purview of it would be. Like, what would they be able to do? Would they make recommendations? Um, would they be reaching out to other bodies, collecting research? Um, can you just maybe speak a little bit to what a subcommittee would even be able to do? Absolutely. Um, so at the time when we did have an active subcommittee, um, you know, so this was, this was in, let me think, um, 20, 2019, um, and at that point in time, we still hadn't quite reached the crisis we are in now. So the, the primary scope of the committee was information, trying to gather information and get kind of a, a grasp of what, you know, like we could do to work towards affordable housing and how we could support other entities in that um, in that vein. Um, and so now um, that, you know, things have changed so drastically in the last, you know, two to three years, um, I think there's a, a lot more information out there. Um, and um, I, I guess I am in, in agreement for the most part, um, that it seems perhaps a subcommittee is not the most appropriate thing for us to do at this point in time. Whereas it's perhaps maybe, you know, having, if we can find somebody to volunteer to go to that. Um, I am also interested and I have yet to act on, act on this, but interested in reaching out to Homeward and seeing if they might be interested in doing a presentation to us as well. Um, because, they are also like heavily involved in this and, you know, like working diligently on these things. And I think it might be informative to have, you know, a, another point of view come before us and see if we can get more information, you know. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, as we've talked about tonight, you know, we can't necessarily make decisions based on affordable housing, but I think all of us would at least I assume all of us would agree that I think the more informed we are about this issue, the better we can do our jobs on this board as, you know, in holding, you know, developers feet to the fire and holding city staff and the planners feet to the fire. So, and making recommendations to the city council. So um, I am in, in favor of that. I, I guess I'm also really interested in trying to figure out the logistics of Shane's suggestion um, in, in getting the um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund in the comments, you know, of each subdivision review. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that at all. I don't even, you know, like, I don't know how you would even, I don't know if that's an easy thing or if that's like city council has to approve it. Um, so that is something that we should also ideally like look into. I don't have my hand up, but if I may. Please go ahead, Heather. Information. Um, generally, and I'll preface this with, I am not a planner. I'm not a member of our planning staff, but in, in my efforts to support some of their projects, um, there are agency um, basically agency comment requests. And there's a list. And for every major project that would garner feedback from fire, public works, whatever other agencies that might weigh in with comments, that, that goes out in the mail and usually an email. And it could be suggested, um, I would think, 
just a thought um, to city and county staff that any sort of housing agencies or the, um, the oversight committee um, with the trust fund could be added to those agency lists for when comment is requested for projects. Because um, generally that's, that's the sort of process. Um, they go fishing for comments a little bit. They let the agencies know and then wait for whatever response they get. Great, thank you, Heather, appreciate that. Um, and so perhaps, trying to think this through, maybe the, uh, maybe the next step for us, um, as far as Shane's idea would be to, um, I don't know if we wanna try and draft a letter or just reach out to county and city planners um, and, and, I, and I'm open to any suggestions on this. I think my preference would be to see how they feel about this suggestion first and foremost. And then with that feedback, move forward to you know, asking them if they would add um, the affordable housing trust fund and committee to their you know, request of people for comment. Um, I don't want to step on anybody's toes is, is kind of what I'm getting at. Um, so I'd kind of like to see how they feel about that. Um, Cause you know, that's, I don't know, that's their purview and I don't know how they might, you know, view that insight on our behalf. So uh, any other thoughts or comments there? Yeah, um, Sean, I, I like the idea, um, Shane's idea as well. Uh, I'm, I, and I think if we step back a little bit, I think I think what we're ultimately getting at as a as a as a board, we would love some insight as to what the impact of uh, the, this on affordable housing is. And I, I and I'm curious if the staff might have a, a different approach um, as opposed to necessarily um, uh, obligating the affordable uh, housing trust fund to be that spokesperson, if you will, for. For that insight, so I think I think the bigger issue here is that we would like to get some additional insight on affordable housing, um, on all development projects, and if that's the affordable housing trust fund, great. If it's home, you know, it's another agency. You know, it's entirely possible that staff has already has an opinion; they just don't publish it. So um, that that would be my comment on that. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, I appreciate that. That's a a a good good comment. Um, so, um, so it seems like, oh, go ahead, Dory. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm thinking now a little bit beyond affordability, but I'm, I'm also feeling like, you know, we get these developments to review and it's in a bit of a vacuum. Like, I'm also thinking that in addition to affordable housing, like I would like to know when we're looking at these projects and again, it may not legally be a criteria we can evaluate, but it would be helpful to know, like, you know, um, this new 19 unit subdivision uh, is going to bring Missoula's housing stock up to X, um, you know, and it's just sort of like, what is the big picture as we keep adding these subdivisions? Because I have no context for really understanding where each of these projects fit in the grand scheme of things in Missoula, how much housing stock we're adding and where it is. So that might be also something I'd be curious to ask staff about if it can somehow be brought to our attention as we look at all these different projects. Just another thought. Great, thank you, Dory. That that's a, a really good comment. Uh, Dave, go ahead, please. So I I agree with Dory. I think first of all we have we have staff involved in this process and they're up to speed. And uh, I feel our job is trying to keep keep up with what's going on in the city. I think we that the, the city should task its staff. They have capable people to basically keep us informed. Uh, maybe a briefing, pay, you know, one pager. Here's the highlights for this month, or here's something important going on. It's not every planning board meeting, but they're engaged. They're engaged all the time. Um, don't They don't have to necessarily come to us every meeting or anything, but I think that's our resource right there. Um, we, we learned uh, plenty for starters uh, with, uh, with, yeah, from Emily and others, um, use the staff. So go to the um, 
whoever we work with at the city specifically about their staff and having them coordinate us with us that way. I'll bet you they'll be more than willing to do it, to get the word out, and that will we'll be more informed. So use the same. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, okay, so it, it seems like, um, and normally we have more staff on here, um, but I think because of, of the agenda tonight, um, folks are at home, right? rightfully so. So um, I can, um, I can try and and talk with Heather and um, and other staff and see about what's the best way to reach out to the city and county planners to ask these questions um, about you know a housing stock update when we um, uh, get a subdivision review or some type of review and then how you know whatever it is we may be evaluating, um, how that may work into affordable housing, or is there any affordable housing component within this review that we're doing? Um, and if there's not, then there's not. Um, but I think, I think those are both uh, really worthwhile things to at the very least investigate and, and see how much traction we can get from them. And, um, I am assuming that uh, Dave is correct and that staff will, will be happy to um, try and inform us as, as much as they can. I think, uh, you know, ultimately the most important thing is, is that we'll have to make sure that when we're making decisions, we are um, making them according to the law, you know, so that we're not under any type of scrutiny for making you know, decisions not based on the, the legal criteria, as it were. Um, okay, so anything else with this, this particular topic or should we go ahead and uh, move on? Raise your hand or holler out. If I don't see any hands go up, then I will, uh, I'll move us along here. Okay, not seeing any hands up. So I'm going to jump us right down. We don't have anything under committee reports. So let's jump right down to old business and the uh, Highway 93 letter. And I think I'll just uh, um, give the floor to Josh, I believe. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Sean. Um, I think Heather uh, offered was very helpful in preparing some historical context for how this all came about. We have some new faces on the board. And um, so, yeah, we definitely want everybody to feel comfortable and kind of know how this originated and, and why we're here today. So um, hopefully everybody had a chance to read through that. But, you know, it came up. Um, you know, over a year ago now, I believe, when we were listening to a presentation, um, <clears throat> what was it, the Long Range Transportation Plan update, and they were talking about safety, and I forget exactly how it came up, but we were talking about just 93 and, and you know, the development that's occurring in the northern bitter Valley and, and the increased traffic load that that stretch of highway is experiencing, and <clears throat> You know what the planning board could do, if anything, and um, I agreed since I lived down here to pull together some safety observations that uh, you know that I've heard in talking with folks who drive that stretch of road every day. Fortunately, I don't have to do it every day. I do do it frequently, um, but I have friends and family and community members who do, and so I um, I consolidated those into just you know, some bullet points, really safety observations that kind of form the backbone of, of the letter. And I think in consultation with staff, um, they suggested that we reach out to the Montana Department of Transportation and ask them to come give us a presentation and provide statistics on, you know, what's really happening and are there any planned projects to address, you know, any of the safety concerns. And I think Shane, Shane did that for us and we got 
in my opinion, a pretty canned response from their public relations department saying that we're not going to come talk to you. We're not going to tell you what the statistics are. And at this point, uh, we're not willing to share any projects either that we have uh, planned for the area. At least that was my interpretation or recollection of it as we, as we sit here today. Please, Shane, correct me if I'm wrong on any of that. And so we said, well, you know, maybe what we can do is you know, pull together some statistics off their website and draft a letter, not only to them, but to the county commissioners and make our voice heard. Um, and so I think that, that's really the objective of the letter is just to say, hey, you know, these are some concerns that we have. And, you know, we understand it's a difficult job when you're looking at, you know, approving um, or considering development. And I don't think we want this to be an anti-development letter but just think about these things as you're looking at development in this in this area um, this isn't an area that the county has identified to put a lot of density it's out in farmland it is you know by and large outside the zone or it is outside you know the area where, where you even have zoning so um you know, I think it's appropriate for us to say, you know, just just think twice about, you know, traffic and Highway 93 as you know projects come across your desk. So you know, I developed a draft. Um, it's just you know one or two versions of this, you know, with the help of, of, of Bailey. And so if anybody has any suggestions or modifications or wordsmithing by all means um, offer them up. Absolutely. And um, perhaps maybe just add a, a little bit. I don't remember if this is in that. Um, notes that you guys put together from Heather or not, but I think the thing that kicked this off was a subdivision going in um out by uh uh was it the, the the athletic center peaks um and that might have even been further back than josh is talking about we had a big discussion about a subdivision going in there and what it was going to be like to get in and out of that subdivision onto highway 93 with no traffic control um i want to say that it was in between peaks and the light at Walmart there. Um, and then it's kind of, you know, built up from there. Um, has, has, has everybody had an opportunity to read through that letter? Um, does anybody have any suggestions or changes? And um, are we ready to, um, I don't know if we take a vote on it. Per are we ready to formalize that letter and send it? All right, I'm not seeing anybody saying any. Oh, go ahead, Dory. Uh, okay, I just have a couple of good questions. First of all, I, I think, I mean, to me, I don't have any problem with the letter. I think really what we're doing is just um, raising the issue with county commissioners and making sure that they're aware of it. Um, I, I, I would, I guess I have one thing to consider maybe for the letter is a specific mention that, you know, we, it sounds like this board attempted to get some good data on it, which they were unable to get because the Department of Transportation wasn't willing to provide it or come speak. So it just might be good to mention that because it sounds like if I read it correctly, the data we have is kind of some of our own <laughs> our own data, um, but maybe you know that might be good to just include in the letter. You know that we've made some attempts to kind of understand better what's happening there, but we don't, and therefore, you know, because of that and what we do know, you know, we want to call this you know to the attention of the commissioners. But um, I think it's a good letter. I don't have I appreciated having the history because I was not at all aware of sort of where this came from, but um, so that was helpful and it seems appropriate um, for the board just to bring it to their attention. I don't know. Those are just a few comments I have. Great, thank you, Dory. Um, Heather, go ahead. Sorry, as a host, I don't, I can't raise my hand. 
Oh, really? Because I'm the know. host. So sorry, I just keep popping on here. Um, it's Bailey, fine. Bailey had supplied me last month with just a couple real quick potential motions. If you do want to, so if you'd like, I could screen share those or you could continue your discussion. I just wanted to let you know that I have those available. They're very simple, basically a kind of a couple yes or no sort of things, um, but I can share those when you're ready. Outstanding, thank you. Uh, so let's see, I have Rick and then Josh. Hi. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of involvement in transportation over the years. In fact, as a citizen member of a community planning organization, I was on a project advisory committee to build a highway, which was interesting project, for, took 14 years. Um, and I get, I get where you're coming from. You know, the problem is, I, I think as Dory pointed out, we need to point out that we don't have any input. We don't have any safety data. We don't have anything pointing out um, what future plans are. We're not in the loop. And I think that planning needs to be in the loop um, on transportation, certainly, when we're considering projects and growth. So, I kind of see where it's coming from now. Um, I will say, you know, it's a highway that it acts like a highway, but it's not, you know, in transportation lingo. I mean, it doesn't have limited access. It, it, it doesn't have exits and entrances. Um, it's very dangerous getting on and off at night. Um, has terrible sight lines. Um, yeah, it's, it's an accident waiting for a place to happen. So, um, and I think that part of that is brought up in the letter, but um, I think we ought to uh, focus on that we need we need data. We really do as a as a board, because if we're to plan future growth, we can't do it with without knowing. I mean, I mean, I, I, it's obvious that there are. I can tell by the deer blood stains that there are frequent accidents. So, um, but I don't know if we know exactly what the level is and what the fatalities are. Great, thank you, Rick. Uh, go ahead, Josh. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, I was able to pull some data off of their website and I believe identified the correct stretch of highway, um, but not with 100% certainty because it is a little bit arcane, the, the tool. So, um, I would agree that more information would would, um, would certainly certainly be better. Um, and uh, yeah, I was going to say not only to the commissioners who are planning on sending this, but also to the Montana Department of Transportation. So maybe including a request for more information would be helpful um, to them, right? Don't, don't just consider that, you know, can you come please talk to us about this for, you know, the reasons that we cited in this letter, right? Um, are perceived to be huge increases in traffic load, bisects pasture land, and then there's elk herds. It's a migratory corridor. So I don't know if you guys have been driven, driven down here recently, but there's 250 head of elk right over there on the Sapphire Ranch and the floodplain, and they, you know, go between the pit road and the Sapphire Ranges at night and, you know, whatever they can. So it, you know, it's a dangerous stretch of highway. I don't think there's really anybody who would say otherwise. Do we have the empirical data to, you know, lay out a really strong argument? You know, probably not. But I think anecdotally, it's, you know, pretty clear cut. Um, so then the other thing that maybe I, this is, how I perceived it, but I thought we were almost kind of encouraged by staff. Heather, you may be able to recall this too. And then I said, hey, this is something that the planning board really can do and should do. And it's, you know, well within what you guys should be doing. And so, you know, feel free to, to draft the letter. And I think I, my recollection is we were encouraged to take that step. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, do you have anything else, Josh, at the moment? I don't. I just, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there to see if my recollection was, was right. Because then I started thinking, well, why did we decide on a letter? Why did this all come about? You know, and that's, uh, not, 
I think staff really said, hey, you know, this uh, Karen and Bailey and some others actually, I think, said, you know, this is for the appropriate thing for the planning board to do. Yes, that, that, that is my recollection as well. Um, I also think we were, what's the right word here? Uh, one second, Shane, maybe a little miffed at our response from MDT. I don't think we were expecting to be told, no, we're not coming. <laughs> um, go ahead, Shane. You just summed it up there pretty well, uh, Sean. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the history on this is important uh, and obviously not everybody has the history of it, but um, this is the, this is the next step. I, this is the next logical step in my mind to uh, get them to acknowledge that, you know, we need to coordinate uh, between uh, the planning board and uh, MDT on the stretch of road. You know, we're going to be looking at subdivisions and developments all down the stretch and we need to be informed and we need them to come to the table to inform us. And uh, I think that we need to, um, you know, I, I haven't studied all the data in here. I have no doubt that Josh uh, has, has it right and I'm ready to make a motion to do it, to light a little fire, to make sure that they come to the table um, as soon as possible so that we can make informed decisions moving forward. So that's my two cents. Great, thank you, Shane. Anybody else um, got anything here before I, I'm gonna, take a stab at a suggestion here. Um, and, and anybody feel free to please jump in and help. Um, but the, the sense that I'm getting um, through this discussion is that um, we, um, I, think it, I think Dory's suggestion to include the history of the response from MDT uh, within the letter and, and some of that like um, interaction, I think would be helpful. And um, I'm wondering about adding that into the letter as well as um, maybe a little bit more, uh, and maybe that's in there, I'm sorry, I'm really busy so uh, with farming. So I, I read through that and then it kind of goes out, out one side because most of my head is wrapped around trying to get plants in the ground. Um, but um, the fact that we need data to inform our decisions and that maybe we could we could gear the letter um, or, or, or rework the letter a little bit with those two components within there. And then also, um, and, I, and I don't know if, if I like the idea of sending it to both of them, that having the draft um, that we send goes out to both the county commissioners and to MTD. And ideally that maybe creates enough of a fire to prompt MTD to wanna come and give us more information. Um, I have uh, Josh and then uh, Rick. I agree with that, Sean. And as I sit here and look at the letter, you know, maybe we need two versions of the letter that are very, very similar but slightly different. I mean, certainly we want one that says, Dear Montana Department of Transportation, and not just, you know, County Commissioner. So um, maybe I could take a stab at creating another version and adding some language around, you know, hey, we reached out to the Montana Department of Transportation at this date after a long range planning update, transportation planning update. And, you know, unfortunately, we're unsuccessful and, you know, they, you know, resisted our request or, you know, we're not able to come and meet with us, whatever, you know, and put that in there somehow so that people then, you know, can kind of track the history of how this came about. I'd be happy to do that and, you know, ho hopefully have, you know, two versions of the letter, very similar, um, ready for our next meeting. If anybody else would has other modifications that they would like to make and would be happy to add that, um, feel free to do so. 
Great, thank you, Josh. Uh, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I just want to kind of want to reiterate that, and, and I I totally agree with that. I think the way I see that letter is, let's not develop because it's unsafe. And I think that really what we want to have is an alternate version that says we can't develop without knowing, without having data, without knowing how safe it is, without knowing future plans, without knowing safety, without having safety concerns addressed. And uh, and we have a, we've been stonewalled. And I think that's what version two seems to be leaning towards. So I would, I think that's kind of where, I, th I think that's what you want, but having not been involved and having people tell you that basically it's none of your business, um, I can understand where that letter is coming from now, so. Great, thank you, Rick. Uh, go ahead, Shane. Yeah, I'm trying to recall, but I think that, um, I think that staff encourage us to not communicate with MDT, but to really only communicate with the Board of County Commissioners and use them as the lever. So I guess I would encourage us to not formulate two letters. I do agree with, uh, I think, the edits that we're talking about and uh, suggesting that, uh, you know, you know, we're trying to be collaborative. That, that that's and we were stonewalled and so we want to use the board of county commissioners to hopefully break past that log jam uh i think that the letter could use a revision uh i would think that we don't want to write two letters however and just send it to the board of county commissioners that's my two cents great thank you shane um and yeah that actually reflects um a little bit more of some of my th earlier thinking too was that um, we try and use the county commissioners to help leverage MDT to come talk to us. And um, I think it would be um, beneficial for us to just be upfront about that in the letter and, and clearly communicate to the county commissioners, um, you know, and, and that goes back to the including that little bit of history of, of being rebuffed. Um, and now we're, we are reaching out to you because we would, we would like your assistance in, in, you know, getting MDT to come, you know, before us, or at the very least offer us the statistics that we want, but ideally to come before us and make a presentation about this stretch of highway. Um, and I think um, including in that, um, you know, the fact that we are in need of development and this area is, is more than likely going to get developed and that it's important, you know, like all the things that have been said. Um, so yes, uh, agree wholeheartedly. Dory, go ahead. Just real quick, I was gonna say, I think the other critical component is that we are asking for this data and we have these concerns because we as a board, will continue to see development proposals in this area. And really that is a, a legal, you know, that is one of the criteria that we are responsible for making decisions on. And if we don't have good data to do that, we can't make those decisions. So I think just really being clear that as a board, we need this information and we, we've asked for it and we're, you know, we're not getting it. Um, I don't know, that's just the other thing I would emphasize. Yes, great suggestion. And I think one other thought that um, maybe we could uh, reach out to the county planners and, you know, is there anything coming up? Um, and maybe it's not in the queue at the moment, but is there any development out there coming up uh, that maybe makes this a little bit more um, pertinent or necessary for us to get more information on this? Um, and um, if, uh, Josh, if that is, is too much for you to, uh, take on, um, just, you know, whatever you need help in, you know, you know, I don't know, there's eight, nine of us, um, you know, speak up and ask for help and, and we'll do the best we can to support you in that. 
Yeah, no problem. I'll take a stab at revising the letter and, and getting a new one in front of the group as, as soon as I can. And I think you know there this may um, this may light a fire under under MD MDOT. I, I know the press jumped on it pretty quickly and wanted to make a deal out of it. So that may you know who knows you know okay. But it is it is an issue. I see it every day. It's it's something that you know I don't want to back off of. Yeah, you know, especially in the absence of having real good information. So, yes, absolutely, agree wholeheartedly. Go ahead, Rick. I just want to quickly say, you know, thank you for your work on this, Josh. But frankly, you shouldn't have to get the safety data on that corridor. That should be something that we can ask for and it's provided to us. We're not supposed to be out there doing our own research. I mean, we can. I mean, it's great that we do. It's great that you did. But I just want to point out, we've got people for that, and they're not helping. So, Yeah, I think that's a, a really valid point. Um, and I think the one thing uh, it seems like we're, we're kind of wrapping up here is, is um, I kind of want to, uh, I want to keep this um, on the agenda um, and, and see if we can keep moving this forward. Um, it feels like to me that we've been we've been waiting to have this discussion about the letter for quite a while, um, and and I know there's a lot of extenuating circumstances. Um, most importantly, a pandemic that have fed into that. But um, I think now that we've had an opportunity to have this discussion, we're kind of a little bit more up to speed as far as all the board members go. Um, so, if at all possible, I'm going to make an effort to keep this onto the agenda so that we can continue to work on this, get this letter out to the county commissioners and see if we can make a little headway. Um, and with that being said, you know, this may take a few more months, but ideally we can, um, we can make some headway with this. Is there anything else from anybody on uh, old business and the highway 93 letter? I think uh, I think we did some some good work there. I think we I think we got to where we needed to be with that letter, um, and and editing and and working on a new draft. I also think that'll be helpful for us with the media, um, in maybe a little bit of uh, don't jump before you look. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not seeing anybody looking to chime in here, so. Um, the next line item on our agenda is new business and uh, referrals. Does anybody have any uh, new business and referrals? No, all right, not seeing any hands. And the last uh, line item on our agenda is comments uh, from the uh, board members. Does anybody have any uh, general comments or updates or anything? Dory, go ahead. Just one quick thing. Uh, so. Again, back to my sort of pondering the River Road and Greeno Drive subdivisions that we recently saw. And granted, I'm learning a lot here. I'm still very new, but um, I reached out to Mirta Becerra and City Council to ask more questions about infrastructure, because I know we all had a lot of questions and concerns about sort of the lack of infrastructure where some of these developments are going in, you know, where there's incomplete sidewalks and things like that. And you know, it's very much this chicken and egg situation where we continue to find ourselves in. And one thing she mentioned specifically about Greeno Drive and River Road, which I want to mention just so that we can kind of have it in our mind as we look at other proposals, is that in the case of both of those developments, those streets are priorities in the long range transportation plan, but there isn't currently funding for the infrastructure work that will be done in that plan. And she said that another thing we can consider is, you know, the road and sewer improvement districts where you can basically, you, we, we could advocate for or raise the issue with city council around some of these proposals we're seeing um, and have, can add them to capital improvement projects where they get kind of bumped up to be done more quickly than they might otherwise be done and where funds could be made available. So I just wanted to kind of share that information um, for us to keep in mind, you know, basically it's a, you know, do now what we said we were going to do later, but do it now because we are developing these areas now in ways that ha are having significant impact. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and I'm not sure exactly 
what we do with it, but I think it's something we can keep in mind. And maybe even it's just putting it in the public record, um, you know, as we kind of discuss these projects. So anyway, just want to share that. Great. Thank you for that update. And thanks for reaching out and talking to her. Okay. Has anybody else got anything? All right. Uh, just really quick, Sean. Uh, did I see that the um, uh, that project out in East Missoula that we recommended approval for didn't get approved? That had that overlay district. Is that? I that I right can't say. Okay. Does anybody else have knowledge on that? I no, had the overlay. Yeah, I, uh, county commissioners denied it. Interesting. Um, that is um, that is something maybe for future dis uh, maybe a little future discussion for us because I um, I want to say that in the past we've we've um, we've discussed having some feedback about what the city council or the county ultimately does with some of these, um, you know, the, these decisions. Um, and I think for the board, it would be nice to hear, you know, if it's approved, then, you know, hey, this was approved. Um, but if it was denied, you know, maybe hear a little bit about why it was denied and, and, and maybe get some follow through with these. So um, I'll make a note of that and see if we can um, maybe maybe do something more with that later. Go ahead, Dave. I think you're muted, Dave. You are. You're muted, Dave. That was covered in two separate news articles. If you're paying attention to the news, it was in there and it was denied and why community came out. So, uh, you know, we just have to keep plugged in. And I don't expect the county to get, just like we don't hear back from the city very much, we don't hear back from the staff about what happened on X, Y, and Z. It would be good to know, yeah, and have a little bit of feedback, but it was right out there. So just wanted to let you know. Great, thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't deny that. Unfortunately, right now I am, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm at a point in the year where I, I don't do anything. I don't, I don't read the news. I'm supposed to be running a campaign. <laughs> I'm not doing that either. <laughs> um, I would okay. say, I would say fair enough. And one of the things, you know, feel free to share those too, right? If you stumble upon them, I mean, if they're news links, you know, bring them to the board. I, you know, I have often seen things that I think are examples of great development or developments that are happening in other parts of the country, the articles that I think are relevant and interesting. And I've always, for whatever reason, felt like, well, I don't know if this is really something I should bring to the board. But you know what? I think it probably is. Yeah, I would agree with that, Josh. Should we put that in a new business or can we just circulate an email? What's the best way to share information or things that we think you guys may be interested in seeing? Um, I think the uh, the best approach to that would be to um, do it either in this segment um, or new business. My inclination is that this would be the this part of the meeting here um, would be the the best place for it. Um, you know, you could update folks if you read the article in the newspaper. Um, I get the Missoulian, but I'm not reading it these days. Um, so, and if, you know, if staff knows better, please correct me. Um, but yeah, and to any of the board members, you know, if, if you see things that you feel like are pertinent, um, please bring them forward. I, I think everybody, and one of the things I appreciate the most about this board is that we're all eager to learn and we, we're always looking for information. Um, and I think, um, I think that was evident again tonight. I think everybody had really good questions and were thoughtful in their in their questions and responses to the presenters. So um, thank you all for your guys' time and your efforts for sure. And with that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, adjourn this meeting for tonight.
Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Thanks all. See you next Thanks, time. Thanks, Sean. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you,